Audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. You cannot control what comes your way in life. I've tried, but I can control my reaction to it. I can control the way I think. The Bible tells us that the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. But Pastor Greg Laurie says we have the mind of God to help us through. Paul says, I found it. I found the secret to contentment and I want to share it with you. The secret of contentment is found in the way a believer thinks. This is the day when the lost are found. It's easy to be content when things are going well, and it's easy to be discontented when life has brought us to our knees. But is our contentment always tied to our circumstances? Pastor Greg Laurie would remind us that some of Paul's most encouraging words were written from a dank, dark prison cell. Today on A New Beginning, Pastor Greg helps us see how to have a spirit of contentment no matter what life throws our way. So let me begin with a question. How many of you would describe yourself as a happy and content person? Go ahead and raise your hand. You're happy, you feel you're happy and content. It's not everybody. Uh, I think there's always that thought that, well, I will be eventually, you know. When this happens, I'll be content, but not quite yet. You know, when you're single, you're thinking, If only I was married, I know I would be content. I'm so tired of of being single. I'm so tired of being in the restaurant and having them saying, party of one, you know. I, I I wanna get married. And then you get married. And you understand the truth of that statement that marriage is a three ring circus, engagement ring, wedding ring, and suffering. So you say, well, We need kids. If we had children, I know I'd be content then. Then you have children and they're still living with you in their 50s and you're thinking, (laughs) how can I get rid of these children? And then you go on a little bit in life and you say, oh, retirement. It's all about retirement. I know when I'm retired, I'll be content. And then you're retired. And you're thinking, man, I miss work. I need something to do. I wish I could go have my old job back again. See, it's always beyond your reach. It's the if only river that separates you in your mind from the good life. If only this, if only that. Reminds me of a story I read about a wealthy employer who once heard one of his employees say to another, if I had a thousand dollars, I'd be perfectly content. So this man stops, turns around and says, excuse me, you know, I have a lot of money and I've never found contentment from my money, but I want to meet a perfectly contented person. So here you go. Pulls out his checkbook, writes it out, thousand dollars, signs it, this is yours. And as he walks away, he overheard that employee say, why didn't I ask for two thousand? See, that's the way we are. That's human nature. But know this, getting more stuff will not bring happiness or contentment. There's one psychologist who did a lot of study on what brings contentment, and her conclusion was, quote, if people shoot for a certain level of affluence, thinking it will make them happy, they find that upon reaching it, they become very quickly habituated, and at that point they start hankering for the next level of income, property, or good health. So, you know, you make thousands, but oh, if only I were a millionaire. Then you're a millionaire. If only I were a billionaire. So, you know, it's always beyond your reach. You're never quite there on your own. Well, here's a man who writes this epistle, Philippians, the Apostle Paul, who tells us he has found the secret to contentment, and I want to share it with you. What's interesting is Paul was in adverse circumstances when he wrote this. He wasn't kicking back on some beach in the Mediterranean eating a falafel. He was a prisoner of Rome. He was facing an uncertain future. He did not know if he would be acquitted or beheaded. 
Yet in this epistle that he writes to the church of Philippi that we call Philippians, he talks a lot about joy, rejoicing, happiness, and contentment. And we ask, how is that possible? The answer is found in a word that Paul uses over and over in this epistle, and it's the word mind. He uses the word mind 10 times. He also uses the word think five times. Add to that the time he uses the word remember. And you have 16 references to the mind, which brings us to the simple point. The secret of contentment is found in the way a believer thinks. It's not found in the way a believer feels. Because our emotions fluctuate, don't they? You know, sometimes everything's going well. Your health is good. The bills are paid. Uh, everything's going the way you hoped it would go and you find yourself in depression. And you're saying, why am I down in the dumps right now? There's no logic to it. So we don't base it on the way that we feel. We base contentment on the way that we think. Which brings us to our text, Philippians chapter four. And we're reading verses 10 to 13. Paul writes and he says, for I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity, not that I speak in regard to need. For I've learned in whatever state I'm in to be content. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I've learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This is so important. We think, no, if I had a nicer car, if I had a bigger house, if I had a, a, a larger salary, or if I had a new face or a new body, or if I had what that person is eating. Have you ever noticed that when you go to a restaurant, you want what the other person has, or is this just me? <laughs> you know, when I go out and order, I was with a group of people the other day, and I said, what are you ordering? And they, oh, that sounds good. What are you ordering? Oh, I might get that, I can't. Oh, what are you ordering? So then I order whatever, thing I order. And then the food arrives and man, their food looks so much better than mine. They can tell by the way I'm looking at it. I'm just staring. Would you like a bite of my food? Yes, I would. <laughs> Why is it that stolen food always tastes better? <laughs> you know, maybe you're out in a restaurant and you're trying to lose weight so you order a kale salad with tofu and dirt and rocks or whatever you're eating. <laughs> <laughs> and your friend orders a big, fat, juicy, cheeseburger with all the fixings and yeah okay it's good <laughs> you sir are a glutton no I'm kidding you sir are a man after my own heart that's who you are so uh, so you order you know they order that big burger and, and you're just looking at it and you're saying could, could I could I have maybe one of your fries and, and they give you a fry and it's like the most amazing fry you've ever eaten <laughs> but then if you notice and you if you order fries they're not as good Stolen food is better. And by the way, let me just say this. I'm gonna tell you a story, something that just happened to me uh, when I was over in Hawaii. Uh, and, but, but I wanna tell you girls something. It's very important for you girls to know this. Guys don't like to share their food. Okay, just know that. <laughs> Guys, am I right? So girls, you say, no, Greg, you're wrong. My husband shares his food. I didn't say he won't share it. I said he doesn't like it. We tolerate it, but we don't like it. We don't like your little forks coming our way. <laughs> My wife would say, can I have a bite of what you're eating? I'll say, go ahead. <laughs> and her little fork comes in, and first it cuts whatever I'm eating, you know, a piece of chicken, fish, whatever, and then she dips it here and goes over here and grabs a little, and it takes like years. I'm just sitting there like, I can't get to my food. This little invading fork is moving around. And then I'll be like, say, eating that burger and I've got the last bite. I love the last bite of the burger. And you're getting ready to eat and my wife says, can I have a bite? I'm just like. <laughs> then I remember, love your wife as Christ loves the church. <laughs> sure. <laughs> my hand's shaking. <laughs> so anyway, just wanted to establish that principle. Guys don't like to share food. Think of a dog eating food out of a dish. That's a man having a meal. You go and put your hand near the dog, it might get bitten off. Okay, so I'm in a restaurant in Hawaii over there with our church, Harvest Kumalani. I'm with uh, Dave and with Steve. 
and they're friends. And so we all order. And uh, so Steve ordered a sandwich. Dave ordered something else. So we're talking and uh, all of a sudden Dave says to Steve, can I have a bite of your sandwich? <laughs> uh, kind of different. I mean, then without pausing, Steve says, sure. And takes his sandwich and Dave takes his sandwich out of Steve's hand, out of, out of his hand. And he takes a bite where Steve had been eating. I was horrified. And I stopped everything. I said, wait, stop everything. You just traumatized me. They're like, what? Dave's like, you know. And then I said, Dave, I've got to use that in a sermon. He goes, go for it. And I did, just like I did here. And, uh, but the point is, if there's something desirable about something someone else has, more than what you have. And that's why we need to learn to find real contentment. Glad you're joining us today for A New Beginning with Pastor Greg Laurie, Senior Pastor of Harvest Christian Fellowship in Riverside, California. We're talking about contentment today, especially when we can't change our circumstances or when life is challenging. Pastor Greg is helping us to find real contentment, contentment that transcends what this world has to offer. You know, as I said, Paul was in difficult circumstances when he wrote this. These are not theories from an ivory tower. This is from the school of hard knocks. Paul had experienced pleasure and health and also sickness and weakness. He had highs, he had lows. He was a hero to some. He was a villain to others. But he learned this. Contentment does not just come because we've conquered our circumstances, but rather because we've learned to live with them. Heard about a story of a man who was very proud of his perfectly groomed front lawn. It was flawless. But then a heavy crop of dandelions appeared seemingly out of nowhere. He tried everything he could to get rid of them and had no success. So he actually shot off an email to the School of Agriculture telling them of all the things that he had tried to get rid of the dandelions. And he said, what do I do now? Here was their response. We suggest you learn to love dandelions. <laughs> you know, that's how it works sometimes. Lord, I want you to take this away. I want you to change it. Lord says, I suggest you learn to love them. This unruly husband, Lord, I've tried everything. Learn to love him. This wife that won't do what I want her to do. This wife that takes my food constantly from my plate. I'll learn to love her. These kids that were great until they hit the teen years and I don't know what's happening. Oh yes, learn to love them. Because life's gonna give you those things that you cannot control. So that brings me to point number one if you're taking notes. Contentment comes when we rejoice in the Lord. Paul found contentment because he rejoiced in the Lord. Verse four of Philippians four, he says, rejoice in the Lord always and again I say rejoice. And by the way, that's a command as we pointed out in our last message. You're commanded to rejoice. It doesn't say rejoice in circumstances because sometimes it's hard. But rejoice in the Lord. Studies have actually linked gratitude with a variety of positive effects in one's life. It's been determined that grateful people demonstrate less envy, materialism, and self-centeredness Gratitude enhances relationships, longevity of life, and even your quality of sleep. If it came in a pill form, gratitude would be a miracle cure. Just learning to be thankful for what you already have instead of what you think will make you happy. So Paul writes in verse 11, I found in whatever state I'm in to be content. Now think about your own life right now. Can you learn to love what you have instead of what you don't have? You know, Paul again is under house arrest. He's in a jail cell instead of having his freedom. He has four walls around him instead of a mission field. Yet he's content. But that's not our nature. Notice Paul says, I've learned in whatever state I'm in to be content. Some things have to be taught. Children are not naturally mannerly. They're naturally selfish and inconsiderate. And you have to teach a child Matters. When I see a naughty child, I attribute it to a delinquent parent. 
not doing their job right, not teaching the child. You don't do that sort of thing. You don't say that sort of thing to someone. That is not acceptable. So in the same way, contentment needs to be learned. It's not natural because I'm not naturally content. Uh, take a child, put them in a room, give them a toy. They're relatively happy. Bring in another child with another toy. Friction begins, right? Now they're fighting over one toy that they have determined is the best toy. They're pulling on both sides of it. It, it could even be a little bunny. They'll pull it apart if you don't stop them. They want what the other person has. That's human nature. And we don't necessarily outgrow that. But Paul says, listen, I've learned this. I've learned this secret that I want to share with you, the secret of contentment. Point number two, Paul found contentment because he took life as it came. Paul found contentment because he took life as it came. Look at verse 12. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I've learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. You cannot control what comes your way in life. I've tried. It doesn't work. But I can control my reaction to it. I can control the way I think. I can control my attitude. That's why you learn this. You learn how to be content. Which brings me to point number three. Contentment does not come from what I have. It comes from who I know. Contentment does not come from what I have. It comes from who I know. Hebrews 13, five says, let your way of life be without covetousness. The word covet means a greedy desire to have more. But be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. See, because Christ will never leave me, I can be content. It's not about what I have. It's about who has me. It's about this relationship I have with God that can bring the ultimate contentment. That is why David wrote in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You know, when the Lord's your shepherd, you can find this perfect contentment. Contentment is found in making the most of the least. And so Paul had found this contentment in his relationship with God. Great insight today here on A New Beginning. Pastor Greg Laurie is showing us the Bible's prescription for finding contentment, no matter what's going on in our lives. And there's more to come as Pastor Greg continues this study next time. It's called The Biblical Worldview on Finding Contentment. Well, Pastor Greg also has a further word that he wanted to share. So as you've been listening today, maybe you've thought to yourself, man, I wish I had this relationship with God that is being talked about. Well, you can. He's only a prayer away. You see, becoming a Christian, it doesn't take years. It doesn't take months. It doesn't take weeks. It, it doesn't even take hours. It can happen in a moment. That's how it happened for me. I just heard the gospel, and all of a sudden I realized this is all true. And maybe you've realized that as well. Let me ask you, would you like Jesus Christ to come into your life? Would you like him to forgive you of your sin? Would you like this relationship with God we've been talking about today? If so, why don't you just pray a simple prayer with me? Say this to God, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, but I know that you're the Savior who died on the cross for my sin and rose again from the dead. Jesus, I turn from my sin And I choose to follow you from this moment forward as my Savior and Lord, as my God and friend. Thank you for hearing this prayer. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, did you just pray that prayer? If so, I want to send you at no charge what we call a New Believer's Bible. And let me just say, congratulations. You've made the right decision. Yeah, that's right. And as you start to live this new life with God, we want to send you something that'll help you to get started off right. It's called a New Believer's Growth Pack. It's full of helpful resources that'll help answer many of the questions that you might have about this new journey of faith. So get in touch and ask for a New Believer's Growth Pack when you call 1-800-PRAY-FOR-ME. 
That's 1-800-772-936. And the team is available to pray with you too. They'd love that opportunity. Call 1-800-772-936 today. Next time on A New Beginning, more great biblical insight on finding contentment in a frustrating world. Today's message from Pastor Greg Laurie was called The Biblical Worldview on Finding Contentment. If you'd like to listen again, just download the free Vision Christian Media app where it's available as a podcast, along with more inspiring Christian content. Just search your app store for Vision Christian Media. Station sponsor. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.